Hi everyone, welcome to today's video. So on today's video, I am going to speak about Dr. Geeta Gopinath's commentary on India's economy. She has spoken a lot of insightful points and I will link the interview in the description box and on the pinned comment section. Do go and check out the complete analysis from her side. Now, the point is that these type of macroeconomic interviews can get very dense and very, very academic. So not only I am going to break down her interview, I am also going to do a very interesting exercise that I am going to use that macroeconomic commentary and teach you what points you can draw from her commentary in order to make money in the stock market. So for people who do not know who Dr. Geeta Gopinath is, she is one of the leading economists of our generation. She is currently the deputy director of IMF, which is International Monetary Fund. So whenever she says anything, we should actually decode that commentary and analyze all the facts around it because her commentary is very powerful. So the first key point that she talked about in this interview was around India's G20 leadership position. And this is what she had to say on the same. The way I see it, the global economy is going through a difficult period and there are many global challenges. And with India taking over the presidency, I think there is a lot of optimism mm -hmm. of being able to address several of these challenges that require cooperation across the world. So as an example, when you think of food security and energy security, it requires cross-country collaboration. We have many countries with very high levels of debt and that are entering debt distress. For mm -hmm. that, to be able to provide debt resolution, global cooperation is needed. We need work on the crypto front similarly on climate finance. So all of these are big actions that are required and India is a champion of the global south and therefore has a very important role to play. Okay, so she said crypto, I did not say crypto. But on a more serious note, it is a matter of great pride for all Indians that India is in a leadership position at G20 summit. It's a definite advantage that India has, but maybe we should not get super excited about this. The reason for that is the G20 structure itself. So here is the member list of G20 countries. Now it has China, it has Russia, it has a bunch of European countries. India does not listen to China, China does not listen to India, Russia does not listen to anyone. European countries are more aligned to EU or European Union. Now you'll say that Akshat, you have become like an international expert. How do you know about all this? No. So basically do a very simple exercise that go and Google that what is the achievement of G20 and you will see some really funny things playing out. You will have a hard time pinning down five key achievements that G20 as a group has had and you will see some very weird commentary. For example, let me show you this and I literally Googled that what has been the achievement of G20 group and this comes out that in 2009, UK held special spring summit, former Prime Minister Minister Gordon Brown orchestrated a deal in which leaders agreed for a $1.1 trillion injection of financial aid into global economy. So if US wants to print more money, they can do it. Similarly, if India wants to print more money, they can do it. The point is that G20 group does not have to come to a consensus that you know what, this liquidity injection needs to be done in a particular economy. Every economy fends for itself. It's a jungle raj out there. Please listen to this entire video. You yourself will get the point. But nevertheless, with India getting G20's presidency, it's a matter of great pride and there are certain moves that India can make. So for this, let us go back to Dr. Gopinath's commentary and let us quickly hear what she has to say on the issue as to what value can India add. There are several. I would say one important area is on digital inclusion. Mm -hmm. India has really been a pioneer and at the forefront of building up digital public infrastructure the policy design has been very smart to be able to make sure that it's widely available and all the applications are bearing fruit when it comes to you know, raising, for instance, tax revenues, but also making sure that spending is much more targeted, social spending is much more targeted, and more generally, greater financial inclusion for a large number of people. And this, for instance, is a model that many other countries in the global south can emulate and they look up to in terms of what India has managed to achieve. So this is one area. A second area which India cares a lot about is in the matter of debt. The G20 produced the, uh, what's called the common framework, which is to help countries that have high levels of debt distress restructure their debt. It's a process that has moved in fits and starts. It has made some progress, but we need things to move much more in a timely manner. And India is pushing hard to make concrete progress on that front. And the third area is crypto, where again, India has views on how to regulate the crypto landscape, 
Okay, so Dr. Gopinath spoke about three critical points. The first key point she spoke about was financial inclusion. That in India, the financial inclusion journey has been really, really fast. So this can be verified by looking at this data point. And I think the current government has done a wonderful job when it comes to promoting financial inclusion. The credit needs to be given. Point number two related to this is that India can become a beacon of hope in terms of fostering financial inclusion all across G20 group of countries and across the world generally. For example, recently you would have heard that India is exporting the UPI model to the world. So this is a matter of great pride, no doubt about that because the financial inclusion in India has happened at a very aggressive pace and India has built structures and processes that can be exported to the world. So a lot of goodwill can be created for India if India actually supports other countries in terms of adopting and enhancing their financial inclusion journey. On another note, I feel that fintech companies and banks from this point, they are likely to grow really, really fast. Now I will get a lot of heat for saying this but think about it in this way that all the fintech companies they have been in that beta mode they have experimented a lot they have failed a lot a lot of ipos got crushed a lot of companies went bankrupt no doubt about that that is like bad stuff associated with fintech but now financial inclusion or the systems have been prepared now how do you monetize that system add more functionalities that is something that will be picked up by fintech companies and banks so both these subsets are poised very well in india for a period of sustained growth the second key point that she spoke about was the stressed debt problem. So stressed debt simply means that you might have seen a lot of countries right now, they are having a lot of macroeconomic issues. What is the reason for that? It is the poor handling of macroeconomic policies in their own nations. And as a result, it has caused financial stress. Has India been isolated from that? Yes. India's debt to GDP ratio is somewhat sustainable. No doubt about that. It's very good. Who needs to be given credit here? Well, well, I think the credit needs to go to savers or consumers in the Indian market that so far our market has been savings oriented market. We save a lot of money before spending it. Is this system going to change in the future? Yes, most likely it is going to change. But as of now, we are not borrowing at a crazy rate. At least the consumer debt in India is not going at a crazy amount at the rate at which the US consumer debt is going up. So from that particular perspective, India does not have that stressed asset problem as of now. And India has managed things really well. But can it help other countries solve their stressed asset problem? The answer is no, because every country would own their own macro economy. So from that perspective, India cannot meddle too much in other countries affairs. The third point is around cryptos that can India set some framework guidelines for other countries to adopt as to what needs to be done on cryptos. I don't think so because India itself is not coming out with any regulations. They have no plans of doing it. And here is a very interesting commentary from RBI governor and I will read his statement out. So this is what he has to say that I still hold the view that it should be prohibited. Countries have been taking different views, but our view is that it should be prohibited. If you try to regulate it and allow it to grow, please mark my words. The next financial crisis will come from private cryptocurrencies. Okay, so I would not comment much about this statement, but one, a person in the official space who is a major office wearer of a particular country starts involving personal sentiments in certain asset class. See, you can like an asset class, you can hate an asset class. All those are personal opinions. If I'm giving my personal opinion, I'm giving it as a normal investor. I'm not an office bearer in India. But if the RBI governor starts using the word that mark my words, he is making this issue personal. So I will leave this commentary here and talk about two additional points. So number one, India has not come up with regulations and it is unlikely that India is going to come up with regulations. Almost all the major crypto entrepreneurs from India, they have left India. They have gone to Dubai or Singapore. So these two countries are attracting a lot of crypto blockchain talent as of now. India is not doing the same. Do I see it as a problem? Well, my opinion does not matter. But think about it this way that if the blockchain space grows, if the cryptocurrency space grows from this point, then there is a lot of price that we will pay. A related point here would be that, okay, you know what, because India is not supporting the crypto movement, that is the end of cryptos. It is like saying that if India is against gold as an asset class, then that is the end of gold everywhere in the world. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to look at that asset class from an international viewpoint. So if you want, I'll make a more detailed video back it up with facts and data and I will give you my complete commentary on this specific topic but for the time being it is very clear that India is taking no position in the crypto space and it will not shape up the crypto policy for the world. So the next point was around energy security and primarily India importing oil from Russia for meeting its energy need. Was it the right move? Was it the wrong move? Security. Now, India has been very strong in making the point that we will buy oil from wherever it's needed, including Russia. We've been criticized by Europe uh, for this. Uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, the external affairs minister, has called out European double standards. What's your take on this, um, India's stand on buying Russian oil? 
you know, from the world's perspective, what is important is to make sure that the supply of oil on the market remains at a high level, right? Which then would require that there are buyers on the other side. And so India buying oil, for instance, from Russia is completely consistent with the uh, price cap strategy that was rolled out very recently between, uh, for, uh, between the, the US and Europe. So, you know, that would be consistent. We do need supply to come on uh, to the market. And if countries like India can get it at the lower price with the price cap, I think that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. So do you, uh, do you agree that there have been, in that sense, double standards by the United States, by Europe, by Western countries, when it comes to looking at, uh, say, the global south and India's geopolitical stance, especially in buying oil or doing business uh, with countries like Russia? Well, I don't necessarily, I mean, I think we are in a period where there are a lot of geopolitical tensions. Uh, there are countries who feel differently about how exactly to react to this war. Okay, so here Dr. Gopinath was a little bit KG. So the word of the day today is KG. Let me know what the meaning of KG is. Basically, you need to think about the fact that she works with IMF. IMF is an international organization. She works with European countries. She works with US. She works with India. So she will not say anything negative about anyone. But let me give you some very practical commentary that point number one was India wrong in terms of importing oil from Russia. The answer is no, absolutely not. India has every right to meet its energy requirement from wherever it feels like. Point number two, a lot of European countries are saying that, you know what, India is making a mistake by supporting a country, that is Russia, which is committing humanitarian crisis by buying oil from them. Okay, so this is complete dogla pan because Europe is doing exactly the same. So you can see that who is buying oil from Russia. So from this context, our external affairs minister has rightly said that we will continue to buy more oil from Russia if we feel like. Now, the important lesson for us is fairly simple that in economics, in international relation, every country has to fend for themselves. Point number two is that if a country has something good to offer to the world, the world will take it. The world will not hide behind morality. For example, in search of oil, US goes and invades those countries. This is a fact. Similarly, Russia has oil to supply to the world. Therefore, despite all the hoopla that is going on, a large part of the world is buying oil from Russia. So as far as energy requirement goes, India has every right to procure its energy need from wherever it feels like. Now on to the next point that is the next decade going to be India's decade in terms of growth. This is what Dr. Gopinath has to say. Hati, what's your view on the decade ahead? Is this going to be India's decade economically on the global front? I'd say there's a lot of optimism about India right now from uh, people I talk to externally but also people that I'm talking to uh, in India. India, I would say, is a relative bright spot in terms of the growth landscape. Again, we have projected uh, global growth to slow down to 2.7% next year, with about a third of countries having negative growth this year or next year. Mm -hmm. So in comparative terms, uh, India is doing well. And there is a, a keen interest to diversify imports uh, from you know, just relying on a couple of countries to more countries. And I think India is benefiting from that. It certainly see more countries wanting to do their manufacturing uh, in India. These are positives. I think the digital public infrastructure in India is very attractive. The general investment that's happened in infrastructure more generally has been uh, very well recognized. Okay, so a couple of interesting points. First thing is that she did not say that, you know what? Yes, this is India's decade. She has not given that optimistic answer in this chat. So this is point number one. She is exerting a cautious tone and rightly so. So what she is simply saying is, let's see, the growth is slowing down all across the globe. India seems to be a bright spot. So if the entire world slows down, then of course India is going to suffer because of that. But what she has outlined is, and this brings us to point number two, that the world is moving away from one or two prominent nations. For example, a lot of export used to happen from China. Now a large part of that supply chain is going to move to India and India is going to become a beneficiary. So what is the lesson here as a stock market investor? Well, you should identify some companies that are going to replace some China oriented business will benefit from manufacturing shifting to India and have some kind of manufacturing advantage in India. So of course, if you could identify these type of companies, it becomes a money-making opportunity. Next, she speaks about challenges. So I'll quickly play the clip and I'll give you my commentary. Creating sufficient jobs, creating high quality jobs is going to be a challenge for India. We've seen uh, employment recover, but it still remains low. 
And if you look at female labor force participation, youth labor force participation, it's at very low levels. So a lot more work is needed on that front to be able to create enough jobs and to be able to uh, make sure that they're high quality jobs. A second area of challenge uh, will be in terms of fiscal consolidation. You know, these are difficult times. There are lots of vulnerable people. You know, on the positive side, India is doing very well in terms of revenue collection. This is coming through GST, but also through income tax. And again, the digital public infrastructure has a very important role that is playing in able to get higher yields uh, from, this, uh, from taxes. But expenditures have also gone up. And so the way to make sure that you actually have a sound fiscal position over the years, you need to have a medium-term fiscal framework, right. fiscal rules, let's say. That's the second challenge. In terms of opportunities, of course, there are also several. Like I said, everybody is looking to India as a source for diversifying away where they buy from. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, for India to be able to get into the global supply chain much more prominently, that I think is an important uh, opportunity. Recently, India has entered trade agreements with the UAE, with Australia, and they're trying to do that with more countries. I think that's a positive step. But more generally, India's you know, trade policy should move towards being able, making sure that there are inputs that, uh, that can be purchased, that you can get the right relevant inputs into the country, because otherwise it's going to be very hard to attract uh, uh, foreign direct investment at a much larger scale. So she has spoken about three critical points. One is that India is unable to generate high quality jobs. This has been a massive problem in the Indian economy and Dr. Rajan has went on to say that hey, one of the key things that we need to do is that we need to accelerate our service sector economy because if we can generate those type of jobs, it will retain a lot of talent in India and talent is leaving India quite aggressively. For example, here are the numbers and you will see that in the last five years, this situation has gone on from bad to worse. The second key problem problem has been the labor force participation issue. This again is something that Dr. Rajan had earlier spoken about and on decade on decade basis you can see that the numbers have been coming down. So there has been a very clear trend that a large number of female do not work in India. This becomes a very important issue to address. So the third key point was around attracting FDI or foreign investments in India. Now whenever we think about foreign direct investment it has multiple components. The first key component is that is the infrastructure good in India. Yes we have worked on our digital infrastructure infrastructure, ease of doing business. So all those are positive prominent points. The second thing that we miss is that in order to bring on investors in India, we also need to think about quality imports because if we build some kind of relationships with certain countries, what do they expect? We need to think from their viewpoint only because we keep on thinking about the viewpoint that hey, India needs to export more, but exports are also contingent on your imports. So therefore it becomes very important for us to figure out our import policies as well. The final point that was discussed on the chat was around the sticky inflation and this is what Dr. Gopinath had to say. You know what we expect to see is monetary policy staying the course. Mm -hmm. uh, you know they've tightened quite substantially over the last several months. I mean in terms of historical comparisons this is a really very fast pace of tightening and now going forward we expect to see more modest tightening to happen and I think the bigger question then is how long do you keep interest rates at that level? As of now, we see that you know, the US Fed, for instance, would likely need to hold until the end of 2023 at least. Uh, but we'll see as we see more uh, incoming data. So we are entering a period looking ahead where financial conditions will remain tight. We will see the consequences of all the tightening that's happened play out in the world. We have concerns about China and China's growth, which of course has implications for the rest of the world. So there are many headwinds. The energy markets are still not settled. Uh, and I'd say the next six months could be uh, quite turbulent. Okay, so the most interesting tidbit from this clip was that for the next six months, the economy is going to be volatile. So what does that mean? Well, it has three or four key implications for you as a stock market investor. So number one, since next year, the economy is going to be volatile, even the stock markets are going to be volatile. I've done a prediction video. Please go and watch it. That will give you more idea. Point number two, from this entire chat, we understood that India is going to take up a dominant position when it comes to emerging economies. So putting a lot of money in India makes a lot of sense because a 
lot of other people would also be doing the same. This does not mean that you do not diversify your portfolio, especially if you have a big portfolio outside India, you should definitely take advantage of developed economies. In emerging world, India is solid. It's a growth economy, but do not forget that emerging economies work very differently from developed economies. So from that viewpoint, you must have exposure to both India and the US. Point number three was the financial inclusion point and the first layer of financial inclusion has been done. Now come the consolidation and building of product stage. So therefore, I feel that conventional banks, they are going to do wonderfully well. Small finance banks are going to do wonderfully well and even promising fintech companies are going to do well. The last point is around domestic manufacturing. Now for normal retail investors like you and me, it is a very hard proposition to figure out what good domestic manufacturing companies are. So what you can do is that you can do an industry play. For example, we all know that a lot of supply chain in API or active pharmaceutical is shifting from China to India. So identify companies that are good at API manufacturing in India because they will benefit from local manufacturing and also have some kind of export capabilities. So these type of industries are likely to do well. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Do press the like button and I will see you soon.